Hello and welcome back to the fourth in my lecture series on eco-modernism. In this lecture we'll be looking at nuclear energy in all its forms and we'll be investigating whether or not it should be part of the toolkit to help solve the impending threat of climate change. This is obviously an emotive subject. Lots of people have very strong opinions on nuclear energy, some of which are based on science and some of which are not. Back in the first lecture I mentioned a 2015 study by Pew Research that showed the topics where expert opinion and public opinion differ the most, and nuclear energy was certainly one of those where it differed a fair deal, with 65% of scientists believing that we ought to build more nuclear plants compared to only 45% of the public. So actually nearly half the public, at least in the US, thinks that more nuclear is a good idea, but there is definitely a very strong lobby that believes precisely the opposite. Obviously this is a varied and nuanced topic, Nuclear fission, that is the kind of nuclear plants that exist today, are not a renewable source of energy, and they clearly produce toxic waste that is a huge concern. On the other hand, nuclear power is a well-known and carbon-neutral technology that already provides a significant fraction of our global energy. Let's say you were a government planning to build a new power plant, and I gave you the following six options, ranked by the expected number of deaths they cause for each terawatt hour of production. Which would you choose? I'm sure most members of the public would assume that the top one is nuclear energy. But it's not. It's the bottom one. The top one is brown coal. I'll add renewable sources of energy production into this picture later. But for now, if you have all these sources of electricity in your power grid, and you have the additional information that the bottom one not only kills the fewest people, but is also the only zero carbon source on the list, which would you choose? That, fundamentally, is the main thrust of the argument in favour of nuclear power. They will also deal with the many arguments against nuclear power and weigh them side by side. So let's get started. So what is nuclear energy? Well, let's get one thing out of the way first. The term nuclear refers to the nucleus of an atom. And just to get past this, it's pronounced nuclear, not nuclear. Nuclear, as in nucleus. Nuclear power is a label given to any kind of power generation technology that derives its source of energy from altering the nuclei of certain specific atoms, whether it is dividing them into smaller pieces or merging them together into larger ones. Nuclear energy first appeared out of the equations of Albert Einstein, who in 1905 published his first paper on special relativity. As part of Einstein's theory of special relativity, he explained how mass and energy are really two manifestations of the same thing. Mass is just a kind of energy, and consequently if you can find a way to convert mass to energy, then you could create power. And given that the conversion factor is the square of the speed of light, which works out at 9 times 10 to the 16, or 90 multiplied by a billion multiplied by a million. That amount of energy turns out to be enormous. The worldwide energy consumption per year is roughly 160 petawatt hours. One petawatt is a million gigawatts. A gigawatt is a billion watts. That's a lot of energy. So the energy bound up in an atomic nucleus is enormous. A fact that was not lost on the scientists working on the Manhattan Project in World War II who eventually unleashed that power in the world's first ever atomic explosion. It's worth pointing out fairly quickly, as some people are confused about this point, that a nuclear energy reactor cannot go boom like an atomic bomb. It's not possible. In order to make a bomb, the uranium needs to be greatly enriched in a very expensive, time-consuming and technically demanding process. The uranium used in power stations is much more dilute and could never detonate explosively. That's not to say they can't go wrong, as we all know. More about that later, of course. But I just wanted to explain first of all that a nuclear power station and a nuclear bomb are two very different things. Think of it like burning a lump of charcoal on a barbecue. It's never going to explode catastrophically. It just simmers away for hours at a time. If you want something explosive, you have to take that charcoal, extract the carbon, and process it a great deal together with some other chemicals, and make gunpowder. The first nuclear reactors were, frankly, what you'd expect to see with 1950s technology, and for complex machines built using technology from 70 years ago, they were remarkably successful, 
ushering in a new age of what people believed would be limitless cheap power. It didn't quite work out that way, but it is important to point out that nuclear power is entirely carbon neutral, which is really the main reason why we're talking about it here. Just like with all forms of energy generation, no matter how green and renewable it is, it takes energy to build the reactor or whatever it is that generates the energy in the first place. And it requires people to maintain it, just like, for example, wind turbines do. But once it's running, the carbon generation from the nuclear reaction itself is zero. If we look at the figures calculated by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 3 Fifth Assessment Report, we find this table for the lifetime emissions of various power generation techniques as grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. Essentially, how polluting are these sources for each unit of energy they generate, taking into account every part of the life cycle of those sources of energy? The ranges are of course wide, but if we take the median value, nuclear fission is the joint cleanest power we have, comparable to wind power, half as polluting as hydropower, and three or four times less polluting than solar panels. Oh, and about 70 times less polluting than coal. No surprise there. Finally, as I said already, nuclear power is not a renewable form of energy. We only have enough uranium supplies discovered so far, at current rates of usage, for about 150 years. And obviously, if we build more nuclear plants, then that will come down, unless we can find more uranium or make our reactors more efficient. Having said that, as an eco-modernist, I want to move to a zero-impact world as soon as possible, and nuclear fission isn't really that world, as it relies on mining and processing of toxic substances. For me, nuclear fission plants are really only being proposed to get us out of the carbon dioxide mess that we're in, which is a reasonably short-term project. In the longer term, say 50, 60, 70 years, we should have other, much better ways of generating power. Maybe nuclear fusion will be working at last. More on that later. Or maybe we'll have plentiful, cheap grid storage to make renewables a valid solution for almost all our requirements. Or maybe there'll be another technology that we haven't even thought of yet. When people talk about nuclear power, they're almost always talking about nuclear fission. That's the type of nuclear power that is used in all our currently operational power stations. The alternative, nuclear fusion, is way harder to do, and I'll cover that at the end of the lecture. Essentially, at its heart, a nuclear reactor works like any other conventional power station. Some process is used to generate heat, which heats up a body of water and turns it to steam. That steam turns turbines to generate electricity. In the case of nuclear reactors, the heat is generated by releasing the power from the nuclei of uranium atoms at a controlled rate, which heats up a bath of usually water or perhaps some other liquid, into which the uranium rods are placed. That hot water then exchanges heat with a separate water tank through a network of radiators. The secondary water is heated up and it turns turbines. The nuclear fuel is contained within the internal section and is not released into the atmosphere. Well, unless something goes badly wrong. More about that later. The fuel consists of rods made from enriched uranium. Uranium in nature is found within ores in which it is usually significantly less than 1% by volume. The concentrated uranium is extracted from that ore through a number of processes which results in concentrated uranium oxide, or yellow cake, which is roughly 60% uranium by volume. However, we still have a significant process left because this substance is actually made from two different kinds of uranium with slightly different nuclear properties. The vast majority is uranium-238, typically well over 99%. The remainder, a tiny minority, is uranium-235, which is the reactive stuff. The numbers here refer to the atomic weight of these two types or isotopes of uranium. Uranium-238 has 92 protons and 146 neutrons, adding up to 238, Uranium-235 has 92 protons and 143 neutrons. So you see the number of protons stays constant at 92. This is what defines this atom as being uranium. And the number of neutrons varies. This variable number of neutrons is what affects the properties of these two types of uranium. They are both radioactive, but uranium-235 is significantly more so. In order to make use of uranium in power stations, therefore, this uranium mix needs to be enriched. That is, the fraction of uranium-235 needs to be increased, until it's in the range of about 5%. This is almost always done using centrifuges, 
which are extremely rapidly spinning tubes, which rely on the fact that uranium-238 is very slightly more massive than uranium-235, so the two substances separate out when spun at high speeds. The process requires a great deal of expensive technology, which is one of the reasons why so few nations possess the ability to enrich uranium. The higher the percentage of uranium-235, the more powerful it becomes, because the nuclear reactions used to drive nuclear power stations fundamentally rely on uranium being able to sustain a continuing cascade of reactions, which each not only release energy, but also trigger further reactions. When a uranium-235 atom decays, it releases a small amount of energy, plus three energetic neutrons. If any of those neutrons strikes another uranium-235 atom, then it will trigger that to decay too. So if most of those neutrons strike other uranium-235 atoms, then the reaction will go rapidly out of control, which is what causes atomic bombs to be so deadly. If, however, the concentration of uranium-235 isn't so high, then most of the neutrons will strike different atoms and they'll be absorbed. The trick is to make it so that roughly one third of the neutrons strike another uranium-235, so each reaction produces exactly one more reaction. This way the reaction rate will be sustained and the reaction won't run out of control or die out entirely. The more highly enriched the uranium is, the easier this process is to trigger and the more readily it continues. This is why extremely low enriched uranium cannot be used to generate power. It's unable to sustain this level of reaction until it has been enriched to roughly 5%, or reactor grade, at which level reactions are roughly self-sustaining. The reaction rate can be controlled or reduced by surrounding the uranium fuel with inert rods, which absorb the energetic neutrons and prevent them from striking other uranium-235 atoms, hence dampening down the reaction. It is this enrichment process that separates uranium going to power plants from uranium going to be used in weaponry. Weapons-grade uranium is significantly more highly enriched, often as much as 80% or higher. It needs to be enriched this much to sustain the extremely violent reaction that powers an atomic bomb. Reactor-grade uranium, at less than 5% enrichment in general, cannot undergo that violent level of reaction. It may heat up very significantly if not kept cooled, but it cannot explode. Over the next three slides, I'll address the three main concerns that members of the public generally have about nuclear reactors. Safety, nuclear waste and cost. Obviously it's very important to separate nuclear weapons from nuclear power stations. As I've said so far, it's impossible for a nuclear power station to explode like a nuclear bomb. Though the same physics is working underneath both these things, the details are very different. It's like saying that you're worried about setting off a firework and having it fly into orbit. Sure, both fireworks and space rockets work in roughly the same way, but the quantities of fuel, the sizes, the thrust values, they're all very different. The main worry about nuclear power stations is that they may melt down. Fundamentally, at the heart of a nuclear power station is a set of uranium fuel rods, each of which is continually generating heat due to the process of radioactive decay. The reaction can be stopped by inserting control rods to absorb the free neutrons, but what if those control rods fail? The uranium itself is contained in a bath of water or some other coolant liquid. But what if that water stops circulating or flows away entirely so there's nothing to take the heat away from the fuel rods? Well then the fuel will get progressively hotter and hotter until it melts everywhere, hence meltdown. No, meltdown is not a big explosion. It's when uranium fuel melts down into a puddle, hence the name. In fact, this is exactly what happened at Fukushima nuclear power station in 2011 in Japan. More about that later. So the problem here is that in order to keep the reaction from running away and overheating, you have to physically intervene by placing control rods in the way and by submerging the rods in some coolant liquid. That seems like a design flaw. It's known as an active cooling system. But we could design a reactor in such a way as to make it so that you have to put energy in to keep the reaction going, i.e. the default is for the reaction to be stopped. If you have to put in energy to raise the control rods away from the reactor, then if there's a power cut, the rods just fall back into place automatically and damp down the reaction. That's known as passive safety, and modern power plant designs all subscribe to this principle. That means that a meltdown is unable to occur. Generation 3 reactors, first seeing operation in 1996, generally incorporate these features, and the new Generation 4 reactors, which are being designed today and are due to open in the next decade, take safety to the next level. 
You can't talk about nuclear reactor safety without mentioning the big three well-known nuclear accidents that have occurred since the first reactors were built. Three Mile Island in 1979 was the least serious of these, with a partial meltdown caused largely by operator error and a release of some radioactive chemicals into the environment. There have been no deaths associated with this incident, though it did cost about $1 billion to clean up. The other two disasters were far more serious. The Chernobyl incident in 1986 is infamous as the worst of the lot, caused by a reactor fire in an ageing Soviet nuclear reactor. Again, the cause was partially human error, partially bad design. The cleanup cost roughly $68 billion, and the accident directly caused something in the region of 50 deaths. Because of the massive amounts of radioactive particles released and the health complications they could cause, the UN estimates that roughly 4,000 extra deaths could be attributed to the Chernobyl event over time. This number is, of course, greatly contested and almost impossible to know exactly. Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant was destroyed in March 2011 when that region of Japan was hit by a magnitude 9.0 earthquake and an unprecedented 14 metre high tsunami which overran the region's flood defences and took out the power supply to the reactor, including all emergency generators. Because of the electricity supply failure, the reactor cooling system failed and the nuclear fuel melted down. Deaths caused by the accident are also very difficult to estimate, but so far only one person dying is provably linked to the release of radiation, and that was a safety worker who worked inside the reactor and was attempting to save the plant from disaster. Estimated ongoing deaths due to radiation exposure in the general population are once again highly controversial, but are likely to be a few hundred at most over the next half century. The earthquake and tsunami in total caused roughly 18,500 deaths. The investigation that followed the accident concluded that the meltdown was entirely preventable given adequate safety procedures which are now being implemented in reactors near earthquake zones. The reactor itself was 40 years old when the disaster occurred an old generation 2 design. Every new technology faces difficulties which need to be weighed against their advantages. After all, the US CDC, that's the Centre for Disease Control, estimates that every day 3,700 people are killed in road traffic crashes globally. That's nearly one Chernobyl every day. But nobody's really saying, let's ban cars, because we know they're so important to the way our world works. What they're saying is, this is terrible, of course it's terrible, let's analyse how these accidents happen, make our cars safer, add in self-driving functionality, and make sure we bring that death count as close to zero as possible. That's what we should do with nuclear reactors. The reactors being designed today are designed so that accidents we've already seen could never happen again. Are there other types of accidents? Maybe, but we're doing everything we can to prepare for those too, by adding passive safety features and monitoring everything to ensure that the next generation of reactors are safe. This section is already very long, and necessarily so, but there is one last area I should consider with nuclear reactors, and that's crime. There are two particularly worrying eventualities here. Firstly, terrorist attacks, damaging reactors and causing a release of nuclear material. Not an unreasonable concern, though any terrorist group sufficiently well funded to achieve an attack of that magnitude could probably cause more deaths elsewhere. Secondly, I should mention the concern around nuclear proliferation. The process used to create nuclear fuel is the same as the process used to enrich uranium for nuclear weapons. This isn't an argument against nuclear power, but it is an argument that nuclear enrichment processes should be monitored very carefully. I'll also discuss alternative reactor designs later in this presentation, which can avoid this issue entirely. Another major concern about nuclear fission reactors is that they generate a lot of waste. Not only because the uranium needs to be mined from the earth, which ruins landscapes and produces pollution on an industrial scale, but also because the process of refining and enriching that uranium takes a lot of energy and also produces significant quantities of waste itself. But most of all because the uranium fission reactors are not capable of using up 100% of the uranium in the fuel rods. They use them for as long as possible until the heat generated has dropped below a baseline level, but after that point the rods need to be discarded. However, spent fuel rods are still highly radioactive. They contain significant quantities of the original uranium, plus a lot of the products of radioactive decay. As such, they pose a significant threat to the environment and to human health. Though, 
At this point, I want to stress that uranium is not a magical substance that we made ourselves. It's a naturally occurring element that we pulled out of dirt and rocks. We didn't create it, we just collected it together in one place and got rid of as much of the extra filler as possible to leave the pure uranium behind. And the decay products are the natural processes of the decay of that uranium. So all of this radioactive waste is really just the worst and most dangerous bits of the natural world concentrated into one place. Radioactive waste is just concentrated nature. I'm not saying that to deny the very real danger it presents. Natural things can be very bad indeed. But this isn't some artificial chemical that we invented in a lab. It's part of the natural world. However, radioactive waste is bad. It's highly toxic, and it has a lifetime measured in the hundreds, thousands, or in some cases millions of years. To store it, we need facilities that are guaranteed stable on those timescales, which is an extremely difficult requirement. Some such facilities exist, but they're difficult to find, and they obviously aren't popular with nearby residents. Plus, radioactive waste needs to be transported to those safe storage sites, risking transport accidents. And having a lot of toxic waste in one place is an obvious target for terrorists. What alternatives do we have? Well, there are four main points to discuss here. The first point is that the overwhelming majority of nuclear waste is low-level waste, slightly contaminated items that contain toxic but mildly radioactive chemicals. These can be safely disposed of in shallow landfill without any danger to the public, and the toxic lifetime of such waste is very short. This makes up 94% of all nuclear waste in the UK, and similar levels elsewhere worldwide. The vast majority of the remainder is intermediate level waste, which is much more radioactive, but can still be disposed of in shallow or deep bore repositories. The worst kind of waste, the kind we really need to worry about, is high level waste, which is less than 1% of the total volume, although that is still roughly 12,000 tonnes per year worldwide. The second point is that we can process nuclear waste. Now that's a dangerous task and doesn't remove the problem entirely, but does at least reduce the volume of waste and allows us to extract a good quantity of usable fuel back from the spent fuel rods. The third point is that the next generation of nuclear power stations, which we'll cover later, are capable of burning waste from this generation of power stations. The question that we're really asking in this presentation is not, should we build another Chernobyl, but should we build a new generation of nuclear power plants using 21st century technology? If the argument against nuclear power is that it will generate more nuclear waste, then that's exactly wrong. The next generation of nuclear power plants will reduce the total amount of nuclear waste on Earth. As I said, more about that later. And finally, fourthly, a more pragmatic point. Nuclear waste is bad, but global warming is much worse and will negatively impact way more people. We should be solving the most pressing problem first. And if we have to create another, more imminently solvable problem to do that, then so be it. Cost is a big concern. Obviously, all other things being equal, we should be going down the route of the minimum cost. The cheaper it is to generate energy in a carbon neutral way, the more of that carbon neutral energy source we can build. The main reason why solar and wind power are now taking off globally is not because of the carbon crisis, I wish it were, but it's because the prices of those technologies have come down so much that they're now the cheapest option. That's why they're only being rolled out widely now and not 50 years ago when we first learned about global warming and the dangers of carbon dioxide emissions. Ultimately, if you want a company to power itself using any of a choice of energy sources, then they'll choose the cheapest. Many companies operate on very thin profit margins in an extremely competitive market. If a company decides to pick a much more expensive energy source just out of a deeply virtuous sense of environmental responsibility, then that company is much more likely to go out of business and make way for a different company without that high level of morals. This is one of the reasons why a carbon tax is an excellent solution to the carbon crisis, because it factors in the cost to society of carbon emissions into all activities. More on that, and in fact more on the general cost of low-carbon energy, in a later presentation. But yes, nuclear reactors can be very expensive, especially when you consider the full life cycle. Given all that I've said about nuclear reactors, I don't think we should be building new large reactors anymore. For a start, they won't be online quickly enough, and secondly, the cost is way too high. 
but I do believe we should keep existing reactors running for as long as they're able to be run safely. And we should complete any reactors under production for a similar reason. But anyone planning a new large nuclear reactor is really planning for a device that won't be online until the mid-2030s at the earliest, and which is unlikely to be cost competitive with the technologies available at that time. So what do I think is a way that nuclear could help us out in our time of need, but which will be cost competitive? Let's look at that next. The main reason why nuclear reactors have historically been so expensive is that they are pretty much all one-of-a-kind items. That is, each reactor is bespoke to the location and demands of the client. And bespoke items cost much more than commodity items, and they also take much longer to make. What we're currently doing is akin to having all of our clothes made to order by world-famous tailors, instead of picking them off the hook at a department store. Moreover, all of our reactors are huge buildings with massively complex systems interacting in incredibly intricate ways. This increases the difficulty, and therefore the cost and timescale of production, and also increases the likelihood of issues with that construction that could cause significant cost and time overruns, as well as potential flaws that might go undetected. Building a new reactor is an extremely high-risk business proposal. This is where small modular reactors come in. The idea is really simple. We've been building fission reactors for 70 years now, and we've got pretty good at it. We know how the core systems work, and we know how the various bits fit together in the safest and most effective way. We can therefore do that on a smaller scale, by which I mean the kind of device that could be built in a purpose-made factory with all the economies of scale and production line efficiency, and then it could be transported to site on a truck, fueled up and left running for years or even decades. Modular reactors are designed to be inherently safe because they incorporate the passive safety designs that we covered earlier in this presentation. The company NewScale is the assumed leader in this area, with test reactors coming online this decade. Its reactors are roughly 3 metres across and 20 metres tall, and generate 60 megawatts, which would power a medium-sized town. Cost projections are roughly 10% less than conventional nuclear power plants per megawatt, but obviously if you only need 60 megawatts or less, then conventional plants are not really a viable option. We could build larger power stations if needed by stacking small modular reactors next to each other in parallel, or we could just deploy single reactors, for example to small islands which may only need a few dozen megawatts of power generation at any one time. An expectation for this technology is that over time, as we learn how to build them more and more efficiently, the price will go down still further. Reactor design has come a long way since the 1950s, and consequently we're now able to build reactors that are vastly safer, are significantly more efficient, so produce far less waste, and which burn new types of fuel. There are several new types of reactor proposed, many of which use molten salt as a reactor coolant instead of water. Because it has a much higher boiling point, this means that they can operate at a much lower pressure than conventional reactors, making them inherently much safer. They also operate at a higher temperature, making the reactions more efficient, and therefore converting more of the uranium to useful energy. The travelling wave reactor is a kind of fast reactor which is a new design of reactor that actually breeds nuclear fuel inside the reactor itself. In simple terms, you put in last year's nuclear waste from a conventional plant and a small seed, roughly 10%, of enriched uranium to get it started. This triggers a reaction that not only generates energy from the fission of that waste, but uses excess energetic particles to turn the remaining waste into a more highly reactive form, which enables the reactor to produce yet more energy, and so on. Such a reactor could continue completely sealed for half a century or more, and after that time the bulk of the waste would have been consumed, or at least reduced significantly in the level of danger it poses. Using depleted uranium as the majority of their fuel, these reactors are much cheaper to run and stockpiles just in the US run into the hundreds of thousands of tonnes. The US company TerraPower reckons that a single stockpile of waste uranium from a US enrichment facility in Kentucky could generate $100 trillion worth of electricity, and that global stockpiles of depleted uranium could sustain the world's population at developed world per capita energy use levels for over a thousand years. It's a win-win. 
Finally, no list of future reactor designs would be complete without covering thorium reactors. So far we've only considered uranium as a fuel, but thorium is another promising element that could be used to power the next generation of reactors. Thorium is vastly more abundant than uranium, it's extremely difficult to turn the output of thorium reactors into nuclear weapons, and they generate up to 100 times less waste. Finally, all thorium mined can be used, as opposed to uranium where only the tiny proportion of uranium-235, typically around 0.7%, is used and the remainder is discarded as waste. Several prototype thorium reactors are under development, but as yet there has been little widespread uptake of this technology, largely because of the amount of expertise already developed in competing uranium reactors. A discussion on nuclear energy wouldn't be complete without a section on nuclear fusion. So far we've been talking about nuclear fission, which is the process of splitting apart very heavy radioactive molecules such as uranium into smaller pieces, and harvesting the energy released from this process. Fusion is the reverse. We take very small molecules such as hydrogen and combine them together in a way that also generates power. The details of this process are definitely beyond the scope of the presentation, but the potential for nuclear fusion is extremely exciting. After all, this is the process that powers all the stars you see in the night sky. For a start, nuclear fusion avoids pretty much every single one of the problems associated with nuclear fission. The fuel source is almost unlimited. Hydrogen is everywhere. It can be extracted from seawater, with enough reserves left to last millions of years. Lithium is also used, which is abundant and is also the main component of modern batteries in electric cars, so we know exactly how to extract it, and we have many thousands of years of supplies on Earth. Fusion power is also carbon neutral, but importantly also doesn't produce radioactive waste, except potentially a small quantity caused by the actual reactor components being bombarded with extremely high energy particles over time. Work is ongoing to reduce that, but it's vastly less than you get from a uranium burning fission plant anyway. From the fusion reaction itself, the byproduct is helium, which you fill balloons with for children's parties. There's nothing at any point in the fusion process that could ever be used to make any kind of nuclear weapon, so proliferation becomes a non-issue. And best of all, you can't get a meltdown with a fusion reactor. In fact, it's not possible to get any kind of catastrophic failure. The reaction is sustained by a very complex and highly tuned set of magnetic fields, which contain a super-hot plasma inside the reactor core. If anything goes even slightly wrong with this, then the reaction just dissipates almost immediately. And as the reactive elements are not in any way explosive or poisonous, then the entire thing just fizzles out. Any kind of terrorist attack would cause expensive damage to a sophisticated piece of kit, sure, but there's nothing dangerous to be released. So when I say it's impossible to cause a meltdown in a fusion plant, I don't mean it's impossible in the sense that it's impossible for the ocean liner Titanic to sink. No, what I mean is it's impossible in the sense that it's impossible for the ocean liner Titanic to fly to the moon. Fusion plants are awesome in basically every way. Well, nearly every way. There are just two slight hurdles with nuclear fusion. Firstly, fusion plants are likely to be very slow and expensive to build at first, until we get the technology polished. And secondly, well, we don't know how to do it yet. Fusion research is ongoing, but we haven't yet mastered the enormously complex engineering challenges that nuclear fusion requires. Recent advances look extremely promising, however, which hints that we should start seeing nuclear fusion power plants within a few decades. However, this is obviously too late to play a significant part in stopping climate change. But it is the perfect time to start taking over from our fission reactors, which will be nearing the end of their lives at that point. Fusion is an extremely promising technology to take out uranium burning plants entirely within our lifetimes and to generate nearly limitless power. In summary, I know this has been a difficult and contentious topic, but that's largely because nuclear power is so easy to demonise by playing on our natural fears of the invisible poisons it deals with, coupled with images of mushroom clouds over the Pacific Ocean. If I asked you to tell me the most dangerous form of energy generation, I'm willing to bet most people would choose nuclear. And yet, I've shown you undeniable facts that show that this is staggeringly incorrect. 
In fact, nuclear power is one of the safest forms of power generation ever invented. Why don't people know that? Because a nuclear reactor going up in flames and an evacuated town are way more dramatic than the slow drip, drip, drip of the deaths caused by burning fossil fuels. One death every eight seconds or so. 10,000 deaths per day. A death caused by cancer caused by a dramatic nuclear meltdown is no worse than a death caused by cancer caused by particles of soot released into the atmosphere from a coal power plant, or a death caused by a coal miner being crushed to death in a mining accident. But the human brain doesn't naturally see it that way. For the bottom line, let's consider CO2 emissions. Nuclear power is a zero carbon energy source, which generates roughly 2,600 terawatt hours of energy every year worldwide, according to the World Nuclear Association. If that energy were generated by coal, in addition to the 64,000 extra premature deaths every year that the coal burning would cause, it would also produce an extra 2 billion tonnes of CO2 per year, every single year. That's more than another 5% on top of our already catastrophic emissions levels. I know this sounds like hyperbole, but if we hadn't been using nuclear power for the last 70 years, we would already be far too far over the carbon dioxide tipping point to have any hope of rescuing our civilization as we know it. Nuclear fission is not a strategic energy source. It's a stopgap to get us through this imminent catastrophe while we sort out the technical hurdles surrounding long-term energy storage and nuclear fusion. But it is a stopgap that we desperately need. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you continue to join me on this journey through the world of eco-modernism. Next time we'll be looking at grid storage and the many technologies available that will enable us not only to even out small fluctuations in the electricity network, but also to store power in times of plenty, to use in times of scarcity. Please subscribe and hit the like button and all that, and do join me next time. Bye for now.